Well, thank you, Paul, for this generous introduction. And thank you all for uh, coming to this uh, lecture. I've been looking forward to it uh, in, uh, for a number of months because um, I f but, but also with uh, fear and tribulation because here I'm going to tell you something about yourselves, <laughs> about your culture, and I'm from the receiving end. So I consider this more or less as a, a kind of test case. <laughs> so if I make a serious mistake, then just wave at me gently, and then you can correct me afterwards. Uh, and uh, if I have it completely wrong, then uh, we'll see each other over uh, the, the drinks that are here. But before I begin, is there anyone here who had some first-hand experience as a missionary in Europe? Aha. Thank you. I'll talk to you, because you're a source. <laughs> I hope some of them would come. So forgive me if I'm just, I'm looking at it from a theoretical European perspective, but I'm delighted that, um, that you are here, and uh, I hope that you will also enlighten me. So I will give you uh, a little introduction of uh, how I got on into this track and uh, what I found so far, and hopefully it will become a book, uh, well, I usually say next year, that's a safe guess, but it usually takes longer, as we all know, right? Usually the term, let me see, the term, uh, the last continent, evoked an image of promise alluding to the treasures of Atlantis, to your left. But this is not what the missionaries meant, not a treasure hunt, but a nostalgic tour of a once great civilization gone to pieces. They were more in the mood of Bill Bryson, the Des Moines, Iowa author, who writes about everything. In the year 1989, he published a rather devastating travelogue about the demise of small town America with the same title, The Last Continent. So the title can refer to both hope and resignation. I use this term exactly because it has both a pessimistic and an optimistic connotation. My story begins with the shock of the loss of religion in Europe and it ends with the hope of a joint treasure hunt. It seeks to analyze how American evangelicals discovered the religious constellation in Europe after World War II, their intervention and its effects. But let me eerst begin with my own personal story of this exploration. And that began in 1988, a year before Bryson published his book. I was a graduate student at Leiden University in the Netherlands where I had exhausted all the courses that were offered in, my, in American history that my uh, university offered. It was usually one a semester. And I was then very fortunate to acquire a graduate assistantship at Kent State University in Ohio I found out it was a famous place because all American textbooks have this photograph in it, so <laughs> it hardly needed any introduction. Uh, and that was my very first time in, Amer in the United States and the beginning of a relationship in which I learned to cherish, especially the Midwest. Most Dutch scholars either like the East Coast or the West Coast, and I'm very fortunate and I'm very lonesome in the big flyover country in between. Uh, Kent State uh, made, it, made the news yesterday because uh, even President Obama thought that Kent State was uh, valuable enough to visit and have uh, his rally forward Kent State. Well, that's what I believe when I was there. During my first Christmas break uh, in 1988, the Ev Evangelical Student Club InterVarsity Christian Fellowship had arranged that I could attend a camp at the Imp Upper Peninsula in Michigan. Great picture postcards to live there if you're from the Holland. And one of my fellow students at Kent State gave me a ride to Wheaton, where his parents lived. And he found it convenient to drop me off here at the steps of the Billy Graham Center, where I was supposed to be picked up by somebody else to be transported further. Uh, my professor in Ohio, Bob Suranga, some of uh, the audience will know him, he is the eminent historian of Dutch immigration, had arranged, had a, arranged a meeting with a colleague here at Wheaton, Paul Snizek, Snizek, who showed me around in the exhibition downstairs on itinerant preachers. Since I just completed my MA thesis at Leiden on Moody and Sankey in Europe, I was very eager to see it. I was immediately sold 
to the Institute. So what began as an illustration of my first steps on the academic stage developed into a long-term relationship since I was finally invited back to occupy the fourth floor here. And I thank the organizers uh, and the, the, those, especially Bob who uh, asked me to, uh, to come and speak and uh, I do it with a great delight. Fifteen years after this first experience, I recalled the Billy Graham Center when I looked for material on the International Christian Leadership Conference, also called the Family, which is a kind of overt, uh, organi covert organization um, uh, that hosts a fellowship house in Washington, D.C., where all kinds of politicians meet. There's a famous book in your archives by Sh Jeff Charlotte who uh, dissects that organization. And that's a kind of topic that fascinates uh, Europeans, the mixture of politics and religion. In a country with such an explicit civil religion and without Christian democratic parties. As this group frequently met in the Netherlands in the 1950s and had chosen a former Dutch queen, Princess Wilhelmina, whoop, that's Moody, I'm oh, sorry, Moody in London. And here in the middle, the frail lady in the middle is. Uh, Princess Wilhelmina. She was the honorary president of this American organization. And this uh, whetted my curiosity in international religious relations. And I found a treasure trove of information here at the archives. By the time I'd become a professional historian at an Institute for American History in the Netherlands, and I was able to turn my personal curiosity about religion in America into a professional inquiry of political and cultural links between our two countries. Though these two countries are very different in size and scope, I found numerous points of context, also in the religious realm, many more that I, an that I anticipated. So far, I had done research on Dutch immigration in the United States, American inspiration for the Dutch temperance movement, and the Marshall Plan. And these lines merged beautifully in the activities of American evangelicals in mainland Europe. At the archives, I discovered the comprehensive newspaper clipping file documenting Billy Graham's campaign in the Netherlands. And the, the poster at the, at the aisle was just uh, a trophy. I, when I saw that, I was so glad that the Americans took it because none of that has been preserved in the Netherlands, only bits and pieces. Uh, and Americans, uh, they keep everything <laughs> and make it accessible as well. Um, its coverage of Billy Graham, I found out here, penetrated into all the small villages of the Netherlands. It was really nationally covered. The Americans are masters of publicity. Uh, I found, for instance, that one of their uh, big news stories was the communist youth that um, tried to um, dis destroy, uh, well, not destroy, but at least to intervene. Hmm? Disrupt. Disrupt, yes. Thank you. This wrapped the Youth of Christ meeting in Amsterdam in 1946, and that was a big story because the more uh, opposition, the truer it was. And two weeks ago, I found out how that happened. The Youth of Christ organization put an ad in The Truth, the communist newspaper, and that was enough provocation to get the youth rolling. So that's masters of publicity. I also found that the Dutch... American immigrant community here in Chicago bankrolled Youth for Christ's campaign to the Netherlands in the late 1940s. There was a famous baker who had promised God that if his son would return safely from the battlefields, he would donate money and get the gospel out back to Holland. And he rounded up his crony, well, his, his uh, business circle, I think, from, uh, from the Chicagoland uh, uh, commercial scene uh, and they paid for uh, Billy Graham's campaign and I'm sure that if you investigate the other ethnic communities that you find similar things and this turns out to be a common if little known aspect in of the European uh, of the American interference in Europe in the process of excavating more evidence of the bilateral relationship I stumbled on a third treasure in the correspondence file of Corrie ten Boom a member of the Dutch resistance during World War II who survived the concentration camps and brought a message of reconciliation. Oops, I don't have Corrie here. There is a, a wonderful picture of 
uh, Corey and uh, the for one of the former presidents, uh, but also uh, Armerding. I, in my, I'm staying at a harbor house here, and there's, they have a uh, nighttime reading, and there's these uh, inspirational um, pieces by President Armerding, and he, and there's one of the pictures is where he's uh, together with uh, Saint Cory. And she proved to be a pivotal early connection between American evangelicals and European believers, politicians, and again, Queen Wilhelmina, because if you had survived the war and played a role in the Dutch resistance, you were a welcome guest at the palace. So all these separate and seemingly incidental examples must have been part of a bigger chain, a significant link that deserved to be explored. So inspired by my personal encounter with evangelicals in InterVarsity, my first research into what European immigrants brought to America, and the discoveries of individual connections of American evangelicals with Europe, I became intrigued by the dynamics of this transatlantic religious exchange. So I returned in 2007 and last year to mine the resources here at the Billy Graham Center. And I must say that the accessibility of the archives via the simple but very effective and updated uh, website has been invaluable to plan and execute my research. Hail to the staff. <laughs> So this is the, the outline of uh, my paper. This, is, this was the, the social thing, and now it's become serious. So I'll first uh, talk about the importance of the topic. Why are European interest, uh, scholars interested in this, this, this connection? What, what is it about the discovery? Why that did it happen? What caused it? What were, was the reception in Europe? What were the goals and obstacles that the uh, American evangelicals um, missionaries encountered in, uh, in Europe? what were the long-lasting effects and the final results. So this is what I'm going to talk about. The first, uh, the um, importance of the topic. I think that my presentation today connects nicely with the mission interests of earlier lecturers here on this podium and the transatlantic connections presented by Uta Balbier and Alan Beerman, the previous speakers who held the podiums in the past years. I was tempted to follow their lead by reconstructing Graham's campaign in yet another European country, the Netherlands. And it is justified to look to that country as a small culture in comparison to the European heavyweights such as Germany and England. And one might consider the unity of Europe from the outside, from an American perspective, eh, projecting uh, unity in Europe that we also like to project on ourselves. Not very successfully, by the way, but but once inside Europe, you'll find, notice that the dynamics of religion work very differently in each European country. It has all to do with the um, uh, existing power relations between the various religious groups. But there's more to it. There's more presence of American evangelicals in Europe than Graham and his organizations, and there's a larger goal than building a catalog of bilateral responses of European countries to him and other evangelists. But well, it's fully understandable for a European that specific circumstances and agendas in individual countries define the impact of American religious visitors on each culture. It's harder to see how they all connected to create a separate European evangelical network thanks to this American involvement. And this topic has relevance uh, in three discussions. First, the nature and trajectories of secularization as it enters a new phase of comparing Europe and the United States. And I'm referring here to the work of uh, Peter Berger and Grace Davy, a Religious America, Secular Europe, question mark. I think it helps to not only theorize about these differences and, and common uh, commonalities, but also look at the actual interaction on the ground floor. A second debate is the competition between religious progressives and conservatives in, dom in the domination of American culture. In this debate, uh, the most famous uh, historians of all, Martin Marty, acknowledged that the evangelicals had won, as he announced uh, at a National Association of Evangelicals meeting in 2003. You won, he said. That's the one side. But historian David Hollinger claimed the opposite in a recent article in the Journal of American History. A third area of relevance is the recent trend in historical research to examine transnational connections. 
as a correction of the dominance of national narratives, which obscure the developments that transcend, transcend uh, national boundaries. And religion has become, or is becoming, a key field of this transnational interest. Can we perhaps see something of a transnational religious identity, which replaces national identification and is, is at a trend that's equally shared among the, con the countries of the West? And when I, when I wrote this down, there's actually a fourth uh, use of this research, and that is for missiology, but I'm a strange bird in that cage. Um, history offers a case study, this history of American evangelicals in Europe offers a case study of what happens when missionaries enter an area where there's already a strong Christian presence. And so far, I've looked uh, at the work that uh, Larry and Edith did uh, on the other side of the, of the street, uh, they look very much on the missionary activities uh, in Latin America and Africa and Asia, but not so much about the confrontation with a quote-unquote Christian culture in Europe. So what I'd like to do is to see when and why Europe got on the map as a target for American evangelicals after World II. There was a prehistory that's also covered on the, in the exhibit. And what they experienced there, how they approached Europe and what was the effect. Did the discovery of Europe as a mission field by American evangelicals weaken or strengthen transatlantic ties? So I begin my story with Oswald Smith. I saw also his uh, papers on the excellent exhibit uh, in the back of the room. In October of 1948, Oswald W. Smith, pastor of the People's Church in Toronto, returned from a six-week European trip and admonished his constituency as follows. Let us pray, I don't know how he sounded. You must have sounded, but I'll, I'll do my best. Let us pray and let us work that Europe, one of the greatest of all mission fields, may be evangelized before it is forever too late. Unquote. This admonition sounded quite ominous. Why too late? And too late for what? Oswald Smith did not refer to the destruction of church buildings resulting from the war. He was referring to the lack of evangelicals in Europe, where the Catholic and Orthodox churches kept their flock ignorant, that's his words, and the Protestant churches had succumbed to liberalism. The result was, in his eyes, a weakening of faith which had allowed the Nazis to enlist the church as an instrument for their hideous plans. Twelve years of disaster, followed by God's justment, judgment. He saw apathy, discouragement, and a misplaced sense of theological superiority. And this sentiment you will find in many of the missionary and evangelical press in the United States, and also in the Youth for Christ film of um, 1951. Uh, we don't show it yet, but uh, there's a quote there. It's a wonderful film um, called... White fields in Europe. White in Europe. Uh, and it says at, at, the, at, the, at the end, where it zooms in on, on Germany, and especially on Frankfurt, so it shows pictures of uh, the destruction of Frankfurt, which was almost completely destroyed. And I quote the, the film, 22 churches were destroyed in Frankfurt in one night. Why would God permit that destruction? One must remember that formerly higher criticism prevailed and modernism was preached in these churches. Could it be that this was a retribution for a faithless preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ? What a tragedy. Of course, he doesn't say so, but he suggests it's the case. The urgency of Smith's call came from the acute communist threat of Berlin the same year. German and Western Europe, Germany and Western Europe could soon, could soon and easily be overrun by Soviet troops and find themselves closed for the gospel. To Smith, this immediate political threat urged him to fortify the believers in Europe by distribution flyers about conversion. That's his main method. Smith had been to Europe before, so it was not a completely new experience for him. But the difference with previous trips was um, 
that he and other Protestants had either concentrated their efforts in solidly Catholic countries in southern Europe or on refugees and Jews from Eastern Europe. Now, the Western Europeans themselves were their targets. So this is a, a, a cartoon from a Moody's Church Bulletin showing the contrast between pagan Europe and the shadows of an and praying America. I like this one very much. Can I, can I just say, uh, um, Ron Shoemaker, who made this, the College Archives has his papers and many of his original works of art. I have another day of research tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you for the tip. I think it's a very powerful message of uh, capturing what the, the atmosphere was in the, in the United States at that time. So when the Youth for Christ revival crossed the ocean already in 1946, most Europeans remember the big events and the big campaigns of the mid-1950s, eh? London, but also many of uh, European capitals. But Billy Graham took the first commercial airline out of, um, what's the airfield's name here in Chicago? Before O'Hare? O'Hare? No. Midway. 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 Yeah. Um, well documented by photographers, by the way, but as... Uh, you're acting too. Um, uh, when Youth of Christ revival crossed the ocean in 1946, actually to not so much to bring the gospel, but to select people to come back to the United States and see and witness the revival there. But then when they were invited and got in the mood and got, and got in all kinds of uh, adventures uh, there. The American evangelists saw that the Europeans were listless, divided, pessimistic, theoretical, many outwardly observing religion but without inner conviction. In one word, the churches in Europe were paralyzed and the Youth of Christ Crusades spurred them into action, prodded them to confirm their commitment and set them up with motivation, models and materials and a mission to imitate. The voiceover of the film White Fields in Europe reveals this urgency. I hope you can Hear it, otherwise I'll read it. Oh yeah, the text is here, by the way. Christ or communism? Oh, different. Christ right? can stay the red tag, but these people need the whole armor of God to withstand the evil day. It is a well-known fact that less has been done to meet the spiritual need of Europe than any other continent. Europe is the forgotten missionary field. They need your help that they may know the Lord Jesus Christ and find the spiritual security that counts in these days of uncertainty. There is an impelling urgency to this need. Will you help now? For I believe this is God's hour for Europe. Thank you. That's the end of the, of the film, by the way. But these evangelicals were not the only Americans active in Europe. Representatives of the denominations that cooperated in shaping the World Council of Churches uh, assisted their European sister churches as fraternal workers since the 1840s. One might say that among the Americans in Europe, ecumenicals, just to use that label, of those asso associated with the World Council, worked at the bottom, at the top, to secure a universal structure for human rights, while evangelicals worked at the bottom to promote personal transformation. And of course, they saw each other as uh, from both sides as being uh, competitors. Mainline Americans took the lead in this effort to open up opportunities to strengthen democracy worldwide by advancing progressive education. Fear for restrictions for this plan in atheistic, Catholic and Islamic countries prodded them to lead to let the United Nations add religious liberty in its public and private expressions to be adopted in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and they succeeded. Here I can quote Alan Roosevelt of course, I have to do that, I have to drop the term Roosevelt three times each lecture that I give, so this is one. <laughs> At the ground level, 
The evangelical, mission, the evangelical mission began in Europe with a few former chaplains cooperating with the rapidly spreading Youth for Christ teams that flocked to the capitals of Europe to prod Europe's youth to pub publicly express their commitment to become a follower of Christ. The enormous positive response to the campaign surprised American missionaries. The reports in the American evangelical press about the uh, Youth for Christ activities were jubilant and proved that the expected global revival really took place. So it was not only pessimism about Europe's future, it was also the sense of excitement about a global revival that encouraged American evangel ev evangelists to cross the Atlantic. A second round of, here you see it is a beautiful picture of appointment in uh, Europe. You see it's reaching Amsterdam here. The second round of public preaching in Europe in 1954 and 55 turned Billy Graham into a European celebrity, but also qualified evangelical optimism about a sweeping revival of Europe. Normalcy had returned to the continent and European responses fell into two categories. The best response was in the UK and Germany, where a spiritual revival took place, while France Switzerland, Holland and Scandinavia finally woke up a little bit, just to compare and contrast the two. The most lasting result was the revitalization of European clergy. Southern European countries had not invited Graham or were unable to muster sufficient finances and manpower to host a campaign. So the countries that resembled the US in its low church revival approach and tradition of pietism and activism responded most favorably to this American approach. The stressful southern European countries, nothing has changed, that struggled with autocratic regimes received the largest share of the less public evangelical missionary groups. So what were the causes of the American presence in Europe? While the fear of communism continued to fill the air in the Cold War era, it was not the only motive for American evangelists to invest time, funds, energy and staff in Europe. A second and equally powerful motive was the fear for religious liberalism. The rapid emergence of a coordinating organization for evangelicals, the NAE, the National Association, looked with great concern to the massive rise of a global economical organization in the World Council of Churches. And thanks to the spread of the Youth for Christ campaign all over Europe, American evangelicals discovered who could act as their European partners. These contacts were individual and after often unofficial, and mainland Europeans had difficulty understanding the term evangelical, what it stood for. Many of them were, moreover, confused by the fundamentalist challenges to these ev evangelical plans. The strictest part of the American evangelical leadership rejected the ecumenical effort as a ploy of the devil to corrupt the true church. Others were more pragmatic and feared that evangelicals would be overwhelmed in this new ecumenical organization if they joined. And again, another group, the fundamentalists, were quick to announce a counter-organization meant to expose the liberal, read, communist nature of the World Council. They refused admission to their council of, organiza of organizations that maintained any link with the National Council of Churches or the World Council. Since separation was their common solution in conflicts, that is what they expected from their partners as well. And Carl McIntyre practiced what he preached, purity at any price. Most evangelical leaders, however, found this, this separatist mo mode counterproductive to the goal of achieving unified action. Uh, United Evangelical Action was the name of their main publication. That's what they wanted, united and action by evangelicals. They fostered hopes to turn the tide of liberalism in America and restore their influence. Moreover, they were aware that many evangelical believers belonged to the churches affiliated with the ecumenical movement and they needed their support as well. Their greatest fear was that the World Council would exclude them from the international arena. Since many of their affiliates were active in faith mission organizations, they wanted to secure access to the mission fields. So they approached kindred souls in, uh, in Europe 
since many European countries had the authority to allow missionaries to enter the colonies in Africa and Asia. So the combination of a desire to advance a global revival and to secure access to the mission fields prodded the newly shaped network of evangelicals that sought closer cooperation in Europe. What about the reception? Apart from a broad and permanent curiosity about the sensational aspect of American religious expressions, and it's still true today, if you say that you're doing, uh, that you're in interested in American religion, people respond immediately with this um, Quran burning minister, I think in Florida, he leads a congregation of 10 or 15. Uh, but that's, that's what, what's creating the headlines in Europe. Eh? It's always the extremes on the left or the, or, or the right side uh, that, uh, that capture the, the scene. It's my mission in life to, to cover a little bit of the middle ground, to see that it was much more, much more happened and uh, I intriguing as well. But that, then you need a little background information to understand what I'm talking about. There were three reasons why Europeans paid attention to American evangelicals. Firstly, Americans were clearly the moral and material victors of World War II. Europe admired American culture, technology, and its leaders who put pressure on securing space for religious liberty in autocratic regimes. Secondly, these Americans could provide financial assistance to rebuild a damaged institution. So it's a very pocketbook. Uh, motive there as well. And thirdly, the war had deeply shaken Europe's moral fabric, and the churches had allowed this disaster to happen. The young generation especially was very disappointed about their parents and longed for new ideals, fresh approaches, and promising scenarios for a better future. High birth rates put them in a strong position. In the Protestant part of Europe, a large group of teenagers had been raised religiously, but in a strict hierarchy. The egalitarian and improvised nature of the American youth leaders and the familiarity of their message warned them to this new phenomenon. Also, civic authorities were often glad to see the, these youth workers organize events for the wild youngsters of the post-war years. It would be great to see the pictures of them, how wild they were <laughs> and how, how wild they look now. So, Billy Graham, Beverly Shea and scores of other teams once again fulfilled the expectation of renewal of the West because it was not the first time that Anglo-American inspiration had energized Europe. And I refer back to the table uh, at, at, uh, at the end of the hall and to, to, to look at pictures of Moody and Sankey. That's my first steps on the American scene. And you saw that was an inspiration to them. And it happened again. Their action-driven agenda and practical approach that transcended church walls attracted a new generation of young believers. The quick, dynamic, efficient, sparkling, and simply presentation of the gospel to the masses, followed by personal attention for those who wanted to explore the value of the Christian faith, attracted those who had been wandering. This positive reception was strongest in the first post-war decade. But there was opposition too, from strict Calvinists, who rejected Graham's Arminianism denying human free will, from public church officials who saw these Americans undermine church authority, and from civic servants who feared the harmful effects of the cultic excesses. So what about the goals and obstacles? American evangelicals worked on two fronts, local and national. In the slipstream of their evangelism and church planting campaign in various countries, they followed in the footsteps of their ecumenical brethren by setting up a World Evangelical Fellowship in Woutschoten, a conference site close to Zeist, about 20 miles south of Amsterdam. As you'll see, all the roads lead to Holland. <laughs> that was the venue for its founding in 1951, uh, the same year of the film. The organization had to prove its legitimacy over and against the World Council of Churches and to foil the biting attacks from the fundamentalist International Council, Council of Christian Churches and to reactivate the respectable but dormant century-old evangelical alliance that continued its activities out of the UK. And its, its activity was a yearly prayer meeting. That was uh, its activity. And that greatly irritated the Americans. <laughs> 
defects. The 1952 missionary reports and prayer letters in 19, so this year, eh, December 1951, began to include Europe for the first time as a separate category, pray for Europe. The largest concentration of these new missions were in Italy, Belgium and France, Portugal, Spain and Austria, with minor ones in Britain, Holland and Norway. American mission agencies soon made a division of labor between North and Southern Europe. The, ministers of American, the ministries of American evan evangelicals in Northern Europe targeted youth and mobilized Christians, while in the South they tried to plant new churches and distribute literature. At central locations, they founded Bible schools, a new type of education in Protestant Europe. I just opened, uh, two weeks ago, we have a Christian newspaper in the Netherlands called the Dutch newspaper. The Dutch newspaper, it's the smallest of all newspapers, but it's the Dutch newspaper. And it tallied 15 one-year Bible schools with an average of about 30 students. So there's a few with 100, 150, and there's many with none or ten. They all but one carry English names. Heavenly Noise, that's kind of that's a ministry for musicians. So you see that the serious Bible schools were multiplied and uh, some uh, Calvinist uh, Christians uh, in that fold I belong talk about a plague. <laughs> that was not the intent. They're all, they all um, copied, I think, from American models but uh, staffed by the Dutch. That's, but that's this, this, uh, this year. The number of missionaries from North America to Western Europe increased from 250 in, uh, or 1% of all missionaries in 1952 to 475 in 1962 uh, to 1714 or 6% in 1972 and on to 10% in the 1980s. I usually surprise people with saying that there were about 4,000 evangelical uh, Protestant missionaries in Europe working in the 80s. That's an enormous, that's the whole population of the student body here, I believe, or not? Hmm? More. more. And that doesn't count the Mormons and the Jehovah Witnesses uh, that are also present. So even though there was only 1% um, of the Euro all European clergy, so it's relative, of course, if you say 4,000, wow, that's impressive. But if it's 400,000 European clergy, then it's small, of course. There's, uh, their symbolic value, their founding of evangelical churches, especially in Southern Europe, and their efforts to pool evangelical resources together into one global network and their contribution to more pluralism added up to a significant contribution to uh, evangelical religion in Europe. This growth had various causes. Some missionaries were kicked out of the colonies and relocated in Europe. The Bible schools churned out ever more graduates. Missionary newsletters began to draw attention to Europe's religious condition in the 1950s. Um, and meanwhile, calculations of numbers of Christians according to evangelical standards, like having a conversion experience and showing good moral behavior, were shockingly low. The highest estimates of American evangelicals were, were that 75% of Europe was pagan. This is the 1950s. And the, high, and the, the lowest, others could only find 1% of believers in Europe. And of course they had a very strict definition of what a believer was. They blamed the church and the incomplete reformation, which had changed the heads, but not the hearts, of the Europeans. Negative assessments of religion in Europe accumulated. Europe was pleasure-seeking, that's the French, looking for the occult, that's the Swedes, <laughs> suffering under Catholic or communist jokes, Italians, Portuguese, or suffocating under the cloak of tradition, that's us, the Dutch. <laughs> The pivotal figure of the American evangelical presence in Europe was Bob Evans. Some of you might have known him. He just died last year, too late to be interviewed. He was the prototype of the American missionary, child of missionaries himself, educated here at Wheaton, where else, Navy chaplain struck by the dismal situation in Europe. In 1949, he founded the European Bible Institute in Paris, 
and remained the key evangelical contact in Europe as coordinator of the Greater Europe Mission. Beautiful acronym, the GEM. That evolved from his operation in 1952. Four years later, the GEM employed 51 workers, mostly in France and Germany, who were mainly involved in teaching evangelical theology and the practice of evangelism. So it was the 1960s, more than the 1940s, that Amer American evangelicals defined Europe as the last continent, from which true Christianity had all but disappeared. Um, when the great exodus from the traditional churches became visible in the 1960s, the American evangelicals recons reconsidered the status of European churches. Initially, they had come to organize campaigns for the churches, but now they had come to the conclusion that the established churches were part of the problem and not of the solution. So they focused on training individual believers to evangelize. So in sheer numbers, the evangelical rebound was a great success. The majority of missionaries identified themselves as evangelicals, that's worldwide. And it was more than a numerical victory. It was also a result of the pioneering phase. The initial phase was always one of preaching the gospel, followed by establishing educational and medical institutions. The next phase of consolidation prepared the receiving peoples for assuming the responsibility for their work. Meanwhile, the scope of activities expanded as the social needs asked for action. A sign of this new orientation were the informal meetings between ecumenical and evangelical Americans at Malone College in Ohio, which took place behind the scenes of the fierce and mutual rhetorical rejection. So behind the scenes they met and talked about the things they had in common. So in fact, the pattern of the evangelical missionary involvement followed the earlier organizational path of the main mainline missions. They secured access to the newly developed, newly independent and former colonized states, creating space for the legitimacy of social issues and, and cutting back on American dominance. So what were the results? Did all these men and women succeed in re-Christianizing Europe? Well, the answer is no, of course. The optimistic missionary workers had to admit that work was hard. They often ran out of steam. But even if they did not achieve their goal, their primary goal, they did succeed in creating an evangelical presence in Catholic countries, where none or very weak ones had been struggling. And they united the scattered evangelicals in the Protestant areas. They collected both groups in fruitful networks and gave them new strengths through their resources and reassurance. The most visible legacy were the Bible schools that Americans and Europeans founded using American models. Thus, the missionaries connected the American with an emerging European-wide evangelical subculture in the 1970s, built a bridge between two continents, and in doing so, they created a European outlet for American evangelical literature and a shared heritage. Uh, that's, that's the moment in the 1970s when all the evangelical authors that were published here in Wheaton, uh, at Tyndale, or uh, now I think nowadays in... Um, in Colorado Springs, uh, made it uh, to Europe. And sometimes those books even appear in a Dutch translation before they're released in the American market. That's a very uh, smart uh, marketing strategy. Many um, uh, bestsellers are first released in Holland in a Dutch translation because they know if they've released the English translation, nobody will buy the Dutch translation. And it's also a matter of uh, finding out whether the book will sell as much as they, as they do. Eh? They mention... Sometimes they call the Netherlands the 51st state. And we're still asking why we are not allowed to vote in the presidential <laughs> elections. But I brought a lot of signs home, so I'll at least have the appearance of an, uh, a presidential race in Holland. Um, the older churches in Europe frequently talked about the crisis in Euro European Christendom, but mustered very little concerted action. Evangelicals acted first, and reflected later. And one of the first political results was an increased pressure to secure freedom of religion in Southern Europe. By the way, that was a joint evangelical ecumenical action. In the process, the presence of so many American missionaries in the old continent continued to draw attention to other transatlantic links. In the Protestant North, they helped European traditional believers to once again concentrate on the core of their faith, 
and to more effectively communicate these beliefs in their own to their own offspring. The quick action by American evangelicals after the war enabled Europeans to break through national and ecclesiastical walls that had separated them, and they couldn't really re reunite without American support. And what did Americans receive in return? First, the European experience changed their approach. Mass evangelistic events proved not the best way to reach non-believers, especially not on the mainland. With the exception of the UK, revival meetings were not a tradition there. Cultural adaptation was necessary. Some missionaries realized that they needed to become more intellectual to reach a European audience. I interviewed an, um, uh, ev uh, the Evangelical Alliance mission uh, that was here down the road uh, yesterday, and he said that um, he and his colleagues had to take uh, classes at the Sorbonne for a year and a half before they were allowed to, uh, on, on in the streets. And they took courses not only in language, but also in, in philosophy and in art, because uh, they realized from the very uh, beginning that that was the, that was the, the themes of conversation that uh, the French would, would like to do. And I thought, oh, that's great. So they all enrolled in European universities. So not in Portugal. I found materials in the, of the Portuguese uh, colleagues. And uh, that was a very low-educated uh, society, so they only had to learn the language. But they struggled with that as well, especially in the all the, the social connotations of inviting people to their homes. First, the European experience changed their approach. Um, and secondly, um, they realized that they had adapted to the culture. The European connection, which emphasized the comprehensive nature of the church, strengthened the shift to incorporate a structural place for social justice in their missions. And I refer here to the Lausanne uh, conference in 1974, which brought them closer again to their European fellow believers. In the same process, Americans tuned down their sense of superiority in the beginning, especially, uh, not to sc as not to scare the Europeans away. And yet my impression is that the European experience did not fundamentally change the missionary views on themselves, on America. Some were trained in sending messages, that's what I'm doing now, and had a hard time receiving back. Others became truly transnational and learned to discover the weaknesses of evangelicalism in America. And perhaps the tables will be turned again, and the wave of dynamic activism will give way to a renewed interest in tradition, and I see signs of that in the emergent church and the uh, orthodox revival that's happening here. The many um, missionary organizations and the grain campaigns have enriched Europe, Europe's religious market with a comprehensive evangelical network to which, and now I lost my page, yeah. to which uh, approx approximately 15 million souls belong. So the evangelical community is now uh, numbered as 15 million, which is a considerable part. They've created their own institutional framework which sustains this community through training programs and mass meetings. American evangelicals accomplished their, one of their priorities, namely to break the monopolistic power of the World Council, but their higher end, namely to re-Christianize Europe, proved to be much more difficult to achieve. Yet, their drive, dollars, devices, and daring concepts introduced or strengthened American religious pluralism in European societies and created a transnational community. By helping, helping European evangelicals to find one another, they prepared the stage for a global evangelical network. So perhaps I should change the title of my talk into the rediscovered continent. Eventually, Europe might be closer to the original Atlantis than many missionaries realized. Thank you. And for the note takers, it's a summary of the conclusions. Well, thank you, Hans. Uh, We'll now have a period of questions or people who want to make comments or respond to some of the things that you said. Uh, um, let me uh, just start off with a question of my own. Uh, I noticed one of your last cards was from the Assemblies of God. Have you done any looking or uh, uh, research at all into any parallel Pentecostal 
uh, evangelism missions in Europe? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, no. Well, I, I have to explain why I left them out. Because uh, first of all, there's a lot of uh, scholarly attention for P Pentecostal missions. Um, and part of it, especially um, my spokesperson for uh, the team in France, said that most of these Pentecostal um, um, missionaries came from England. And that's perhaps you not, not true for everyone, but it was a large Pentecostal imp impact from, uh, from England. Um, and in fields, um, at that time, Pentecostalism was um, still considered by Europeans as something of the, um, say, the cultic. So what, uh, what I try to zoom in is, is more the, the middle ground, the middle. So I, l I left those out. There could be interesting uh, parallels to be made. They looked, um, I know that uh, evangelical ministers looked at the way that, um, I'm not sure whether you like uh, the combination, but Jehovah Witnesses and Pentecostals operated because they were apparently very successful in, in planting new churches and they were <laughs> trying to find out uh, what uh, what methods they used and uh, were apparently successful. So there was some interaction there, but I I already have to cover, say, <laughs> 20 countries, uh, five decades, and 141 evangelical agencies, which is a hard time to understand for a simple European who is used to the church in the, on the square, to uh, not to make it too complicated, but it's, it, it's uh, promising for uh, a future comparison. Thanks. Okay, it's about, and now uh, I can ask you, Hans, uh, sure. to repeat the question when it's asked, so oh, yeah. we'll have it for the uh, recording. Good. Uh, who has a question or a comment? Yes, uh, sir. Could you say something to the relationship between the evangelical churches in Europe and the institutional or denominational churches in Europe? Any change? Now or okay, then? Yeah. yeah. Today. Today. The question is uh, the the, conte the the context uh, between evangelical free groups. That's probably what yeah. you're referring to, and the established churches uh, in uh, in Europe. Um, I see a rapprochement, a very strong. I can only actually I, I'm. I can only talk about the Dutch situation, where the evangelical uh, at Evangelisch Werkverband. It's, uh, it's uh, say the working group of evangelicals within uh, the Protestant Church of the Netherlands is, uh, has a very, very strong position now. Acknowledged, it, it took them 20 years to, uh, to, uh, to claim that. And it seemed in the 1980s when the first wave, uh, you notice my, my talk stopped in the 1980s because actually then there was a, a kind of um, slack, and, uh, and, and, um, um, yeah, what say, say, um, a low tide of evangelicalism in uh, in Europe, and, and you can find articles that describe, oh, that, that is the end of evangelicalism, and then you see a return uh, after the turn of the century, uh, and uh, especially uh, the main the main churches look uh, very carefully uh, how it's possible that uh, the evangelical churches uh, maintain their youth, not so much because they're so they're so much growing. There's a lot of circulation of the saints going on. But uh, they apparently are uh, better in, uh, at least there's some use there. And that's, of course, the great, great, great um, uh, uh, danger <coughs> that's, uh, that's threatening uh, the churches um, in, in Holland, too, that the next generation is completely gone. So th I see a rapprochement also because there's less Christians left. So they uh, are becoming a, a minority uh, and, and, and link up more closely. Thank you, sir. Do you talk about revival in Europe? And yeah, when, it, when there was an explosion of, you know, of God's presence in Europe and, you know, and slowly evaporated, or can you speak about that? Well, um, I would say no. I don't talk about so much about revival. When, when, um, th when I first came to the United States, to, to give you an example, in 1988, and I saw a sign at the church that said, next week revival, I said, <laughs> It's interesting. <laughs> How do you schedule it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, uh, so I realized that revival is a, 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 a term that's uh, very often used to um, as encouragement or explicit uh, uh, preaching. Uh, and in that re respect, I see you see smaller revival movements. But I don't see that you have those four big um, 
awakenings and, and revival waves in, um, in American culture, except for Britain and, and, and pockets in Germany, uh, it, that if there are revivals, they are very local. And I, I saw it when I, when I did research in the, the Okinga papers, uh, you, s you see, at, at least I saw uh, when I read through uh, the pages in of the, of the, the, um, the magazines of the, of the 1940s, that there was a kind of growing expectation, will it happen, will it happen? You see, uh, the more people talk about it, the likelihood that it will happen increases. Yes, because it had happened before. Uh, we have, you had a third great awakening, and uh, that there will be a fourth. And when is it happening? Uh, and that's a in Europe, that's a completely different concept. We don't have, if there's a revival, it's, um, it's usually limited to uh, the elite, and then it becomes an intellectual uh, rediscovery, but it's never the mass sweeping uh, movement that it is in, uh, in, uh, in America. That's a very different uh, how the, the, the history of revivals uh, shapes the expectation of uh, American uh, Christians and, and perhaps also, also outside the church that's not present in Europe. So that's also one of the reasons why they, after the first decade, were a bit frustrated because it, it really didn't. And while it's also an explanation why while uh, Billy Graham was so excited about the initial response, which were mainly Christians that, that came to his events, the 80 percent to in the big halls were 20, 40, 60,000 at least in, uh, in, in, uh, in on the mainland, and he took it also as a as a sign of revival. While it was much more um, confirmation and reassurance, but he took that European response as part to build up the uh, revival in America. At, at least that's what I what I see happen. Does it answer your question? Uh, yes. Or did you actually ask him something else? I think you, you answered. Okay, thank you. Can you use the number 50 million? W what would you consider the, uh, even those who identify themselves as evangelical as a percentage of the European population? That's about 5%. 5%? Five percent? Oh, oh, oh yeah, the, the, the 50 million, that's the that's the figure of the official uh, website of the uh, European Evangelical Association, and they they um, uh, that's what they quote, and that's uh, probably all the organizations that, um, um, that are connected with the national um, evangelical associations uh, combined, and it functions like here the National Association of Evangelical Churches, agencies, and individual uh, churches uh, are counted in that. So it's and they use that as a as a as a sign of um, say the third, a third way, a third way in in uh, in Christianity. Done. I wonder if, it, if you've explored uh, the makeup of the initial wave. Uh, what percentage might be GIs returning to Europe after living mm. and experiencing culture? Yes. The question is whether. Uh, there was a, uh, whether there was a high percentage of GIs, uh, of military uh, personnel, uh, returning uh, as missionaries to Europe. Um, I have not tallied them, but um, Bob Evans and also the people that I interviewed, uh, many of them were army chaplains or navy chaplains. And uh, uh, why, why were they uh, likely candidates to return? They stayed with the troops after um, uh, the war, and especially those who came up through Italy, through the campaign in the, in the, in the boot of Italy, uh, stayed there for a, a long time because the advance didn't happen as fast as they had uh, uh, hoped. And they linked up with uh, uh, Christians in, uh, in the neighborhood. That's what they tried. And then they found out how weak the, the Protestant churches were, especially in, uh, in Italy. So many of them had their first experience there or in France. Uh, the same uh, thing is true in, uh, in France. And yes, there were 16 million people, m men mostly, uh, involved in World War II. So it was very likely that a number of them uh, uh, returned because that was their first international experience. And secondly, they got, uh, many of them got um, a degree from a Bible school. Uh, they used the GI Bill to get uh, to school, to go to here to Wheaton or Moody, and then were inspired to return. So I cannot give you a figure, but um, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that it, it played a significant role. But maybe somebody else in the audience knows, uh, Joel Carpenter uh, writes a little bit about it, but he, he doesn't give figures too. But if you read the biographies, uh, 
then they all have military service for some reason. And of course another area, and this is one that we have <laughs> documented in the archives, is uh, the aviators who came out of uh, Air Force experience in World War II, not in Europe so much of course, but uh, in all other parts of the world, uh, so many of them after their military service went into flying uh, military aviation to places that were all beforehand completely remote and impossible to reach. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, I know your research was primarily for 1980, but do you know today where the, where the trend seems to be headed in terms of missionary going to Europe? Is it still, is that percentage still growing? I think it's, it's rather, the, the uh, question is whether the, the, the trends that I showed on the, on the chart of about 10% of uh, missionaries, uh, um, American missionaries uh, having the destination of Europe, but that's still true uh, 20 years, so in the last 30 years. Um, <coughs> um, there's a change, and that is many uh, missionaries become, become short term. So it's difficult to compare uh, what's a missionary. Are you a missionary if you are you two weeks in Madrid enjoying good paella and distributing tracts? Oh, that's a cynical European remark. But <laughs> do you count as a missionary? then or um, yes there is still a presence but I think it's it's uh, lower because um, the the wave was in the pioneer phase and the, the the purpose especially of the church planters was to uh, pull out sooner usually later uh, to to uh, to make the church indigenous and that's what that was happening in the 1960s uh, then they realized that um, if they would stay, American missionaries would stay, then um, uh, the church would be identified with those Americans and would never become native. So uh, they pulled out. So, uh, and, and a number in France, uh, it led to a number of, uh, of new evangelical uh, churches that are almost completely uh, run by the French. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you see a new wave of more, um, uh, it's almost say rehabilitation uh, uh, works among drug addicts in Holland. You see that very happening. I may have Amsterdam. You could smell it. Yeah, my wheat. I just moved my daughter to Amsterdam, and when you walk there, you just uh, what you miss severely here at Wheat. And there's not a cigarette. Si I'm not a smoker. There's not a cigarette uh, smell to be discovered in the great neighborhood, as if there's a sign you don't. You're not allowed to smoke one and a half miles in the neighborhood of Wheaton here. <laughs> But in Amsterdam, of course, uh, City of Liberty um, uh, is there, and, and uh, the many uh, Teen Challenge, for instance, was the first. So this, it's a different kind of mi uh, ministers, uh, ministries that come uh, come to Europe. But they're, they're still there. Uh, I, I also found there's a number of Baptist um, uh, ministries in, in the Netherlands, uh, and then, of course, my response is typically of a, a native. Probably, why, why can't we do that ourselves? I mean, why do we need Americans? Uh, they have to learn this different guttural language that they will never get really right. Mm -hmm. And uh, but th again, they 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 target um, mostly inner cities uh, and um, Catholic neighborhoods. So I couldn't give you the quite figure because it's difficult to calculate. But the presence is still there, but it's in the same share. Uh, probably not because the, the nature of the missionaries changed and the phase of missionary work changed as well. Satisfying? Good. Looking from the European viewpoint of this, to what extent did it seem, and among what segments, did it seem arrogant for mm. Americans to come and say, we're going to bring Christianity back? Yes, the correct. In what segments <laughs> that differ among different segments of it's a very good question that asks about whether Europeans thought it was a very arrogant, uh, a gar arrogant, uh, um, to form uh, by Americans to come to Europe and bring the gospel. That was, among many, uh, ch especially in church circles, a very uh, common response. Uh, especially because it was a very um, defined um, uh, Christianity, um, which. Um, I remember, i give you an example of that. Uh, I grew up in a small uh, coastal uh, place called Katwijk, and a friend of mine uh, joined, um, joined uh, was converted by a Baptist 
I think he was a part of a Southern Baptist uh, uh, ministry. He was Dutch, but I think he studied in one of the, the schools here. And he was baptized. Uh, I'm a good Dutch Calvinist, so I came with my, my feathers on, or what, what's the expression? So I said, okay, uh, let's have a conversation. Okay. Yes, sir. And so we got to talk, it, a baptism service is not the best place to start a discussion. <laughs> but at some point he said, and I, I very much remember that, because I asked him this question, why are you doing this? this Katwijk, the place where I'm come, I think they go door to door uh, for an offering to build a new church because every, everybody belongs to the Dutch Reformed Church. Uh, so it's a very, very densely churchly populated area. So why are you coming here? And he said to me, you know that the Baptist is the largest denomination in the world. And I said to him, in my innocence, not here. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I expressed in my idea, my, my, my uh, this is just an anecdotal story, of course, but my first response was, okay, what are you doing here? I mean, it's uh, wonderful. But the, the source of irritation was, of course, a, a vocal and complete rejection of, of um, infant baptism. And that, 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 that caused an enormous barrier for most of them. You said, uh, when, when did evangelicals become accepted? Well, when now there's, on the one hand, there's many, well, many, but a growing number of Protestant churches who allow both, both infant baptism and adult baptism. That's equally uh, acceptable, as long as you subscribe to the covenant. That's what the minister says. Um, on the other hand, there's um, a new, new independent um, churches like Cross, I'm not like, but at Crossroads is an, int an American. Crossroads, That's, is that an American type of church? Well, or, or is it just a fancy name for an international church in the, in the Netherlands where it's also allowed? Yeah. So um, um, most of the, uh, the rejection came uh, of the, uh, the minority point of view of the reje rejection of infant baptism. Uh, on the other hand, there was always also a great appreciation of the vigor, enthusiasm and creativity of uh, American evangelicals, so there was uh, it was usually a mixed response. Can uh, sure just uh, add something to it. One one classic example of, of European um, regarding American evangelism as arrogance, as a destruction of American arrogance, was during Graham's 1954 London Crusade when he came over. Uh, there had been a one of his booklets had a, that had been released. Uh, the calendar actually had something to the effect that. Uh, what um, uh, war is not destroyed in Europe, socialism is destroying now, and there was an enormous uh, uh, to do in England and all the newspapers about why this American is coming over to save us. There's a political cartoon back uh, on one of the tables there. You see a huge picture of Billy Graham, and there's a crowd, there's a line of uh, Londoners beneath reading their newspapers, and every newspaper has some headline like sex scandal in the United States or uh, race, uh, race wars in the United States, something like that. And one, uh, one Londoner was turning to another and saying, uh, you know, with the bare interest, who's this guy in the poster? And the guy says, it's some American who's coming over here to save us. Uh, and Graham, of course, this was in, there was inquiries in Parliament when Graham was coming over, etc. And uh, of course, one of his great strengths as an evangelist is uh, um, this. Um, humility that he has or this ability to project and connect with people. He had an interview with the British columnist Cassandra and won him over and Cassandra then wrote favorable replies. So uh, it was a uh, classic example and it's also, uh, at least in this particular case, examples of some of the, some of the tactics that Graham and others used to at least create a hearing to emphasize European culture, to emphasize European contributions to the Reformation and to the church at large and to say, I'm not coming, and you find this in several of the things, I'm not coming here to tell you uh, to bring American virtues to you. We have all these sins in America. There's plenty of you know, fallen people in America. I'm coming here to preach the gospel, which is universal. Uh, in addition, uh, that's exactly Graham's strength because he did not found churches. And that was okay. When Graham did that, it was okay because he told people, go to your own church. 
But when um, um, especially denominational missions came that had no former presence in, in the Netherlands, that was something different because that's one of the major um, uh, differences between the United States and Europe. Um, the church is territorial. Uh, you have the Dutch Reformed Church uh, and the Church of, of Germany and the Anglican Church, the Church of England, and that's territorial, but also within uh, the territory, this is my parish. And there's churches that don't allow you to worship in this church when you live on the other side of the street where there's the boundary and we had an agreement, you go to that church and you go here. So what happens when there's a new church in your block? That's, that's an immediate competition. So that's, that's different from arrogant, but uh, that could easily um, the, the be felt as an intrusion of, um, of, of the territory. And that's still the case. I mean, that's why, why don't... Europeans plant so many churches as, as you do here. Part of it is, the answer is out, res out of respect of the territory. And that's what, not what you do, because you encroach on some, somebody else's. And you steal the sheep of another, yeah. of another uh, uh, parish. But so Graham and the, the visible campaigns were different from uh, the church planting operations in your backyard. One other element that might be mentioned is that uh, Graham had always made a uh, point he always had a great many uh, British or German or uh, other sponsors in the countries where he was working. So he could always say, these people invited me over. Mm -hmm. and, uh, there was a question here. And Sir. Two part. The first one is, have study Bibles gained any acceptance or widely distributed, distributed there? But the mo main question is, what would a Bible writing its own diary in Europe say about how it is used, what they do with it, how does it impact the churches, how is it used for discipling and training disciples to be disciplers? What is the role? If a Bible were writing its own diary, today I did this and I went to this denomination and in all these different groups. Where is the Bible? It's a simple question, uh, if I translate it. What's the role of the Bible in Europe, basically? And did uh, American uh, uh, translations of uh, American Bibles, and especially Bibles with well, study Bibles? I'm, I'm study Bibles can be in any language. Yeah. If they have helps and answers so that a person has a 24-7 answer, book on his Mm -hmm. Well, um, it's a different topic. I did not really research that, so you, I'm, I'm giving you um, an answer from my personal experience, which is... Well, I'm, I'm mainly interested in what is happening and how is the Bible used in, in Europe. In all these different groups <laughs> in Europe. So, um, by American groups? Or by just by, by the by Europeans? By even the Europeans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you have time for another uh, lecture? No, no. Um, what I that. yes. You can delete that one. <laughs> um, what I see is that, um, and that's I think is a result of the 1970s, um, say merging of European evangelicals and American evangelicals in one, in a connection, where you get uh, many translations of um, American literature. But the first things that are translated are uh, study guides to the Bible, the navigator brochures of, uh, for every individual Bible book. So, um, and uh, used for small groups, um, for sometimes for catechism teaching, and especially for quiet time. That is something that came out of the, the Oxford movement, but I think uh, evan evangelicals are very strong on that. It was hardly encouraged by, um, by uh, regular, uh, in regular mainline churches. So I think um, uh, one of the results that I could add to this is that, uh, say, the personal devotional reading of the Bible um, um, became more important. And in the slipstream of that, um, and I remember very well when we used those uh, books in my, my student union, and the first question was, um, tell me how you feel about 
And we said, well, let's skip the first American question, <laughs> because that's not the question that a, a Dutch person would volunteer as first. So they were adapted, and later on you got, say, uh, European versions that more or less did the same without being uh, exactly a, a copy of what was, c was coming from, um, uh, from America. So it taught, say, devotional reading, I think, and it also served as um, a model for a, trans a translation, and not only the translation from English to uh, a European language, but to adapt it to the expectations there. So that's what I've perceived. Is that an answer that's... You can only say what's there. That's true, that's true. There were two, yeah, uh, okay. sorry, and then you, yeah. I just wondered, you mentioned uh, Tori Ten Boom at the very beginning, and she became quite a celebrity in the United States, and I just wondered if she played any particular role in this phenomenon that you're talking about in terms of networking or um, connecting evangelicals and the Netherlands, particularly with uh, folks in the United States. The question is about the role that Cory Ten Boom uh, played in establishing or fortifying the evangelical network. Um, I'm not sure whether there is um, a real uh, serious biography of Corrie ten Boom yet. There's a lot of uh, My Life is Cory type of, of, uh, of books. But I think um, she was one of the first to, uh, see, uh, very important, a very important role. She was one of the first, uh, say, European uh, um, missionaries, if you say, speakers in, in the United States uh, with, with her message of reconciliation. And uh, through her, she um, brought an international uh, awareness. Uh, she was very supportive. I think she was even a member of the first uh, Youth for Christ board in the Netherlands. She got Billy Graham access to the palace because the Queen in 1940 55, such a mass preacher, uh, plebs. That's not something that she wants to associate with. But Cory, and when you have a resistance card, a key in your hand, you can open the palace. And Cory was great. And Billy Mina loved Cory. So when Cory said, meet my friend Billy, he said, OK, let's do him. So, and that helped <laughs> greatly. I mean, that's what Billy did. He could, uh, one of the, the reasons he could not present all the sports heroes and the, and the, and the musicians, because nobody had ever <laughs> heard of baseball in, in, in Europe. So he, he needed other kind of celebrities and uh, the, the, the European elite uh, in, in various uh, circles were his, um, his representatives and Corrie ten Boom played an enormous part especially in Holland uh, when uh, The Hiding Place was filmed in, the ni in 1976 uh, became very popular because this was a Dutch story and all um, especially her role in World War II made her a part of the dominant culture uh, in the Netherlands. All our literature is sooner or later refers to the war. And uh, a person who played an, an, an heroic role and still be modest about it, um, uh, had an enormous prestige. So uh, yes, I think she played an enormous uh, uh, role and she wrote interesting enough in Pentecostal uh, uh, weeklies, uh, a daily column, a weekly column about her travels here in, uh, in the United States. When she went hand to hand, somebody, so mm -hmm. mysterious ways of there, she found a person in Philadelphia who brought her over to mm -hmm. Chicago and New York, and then, and then she writes about all these things that, that, that happened. And her books sold uh, enormously uh, uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands. So, but but it, it's worth a serious study to uh, Yep. St. Cory needs uh, a biography. <laughs> uh, and I might add, too, in the archives, sure. I think you've seen them, Hans. Yeah. We have uh, her newsletter, which started very early in the late mm -hmm. 1940s, Hello, Friend, which was also published in German and I think in Spanish about her travels mm -hmm. everywhere. Uh, there's a photograph in the back table of her shaking hands with Tory Johnson, the first president of uh, Youth for Christ. This was in 1947 or 48, I think, at the formation of the Dutch mm -hmm. uh, Youth for Christ. And she was very prominent in the photograph as a group mm. that was uh, bringing it to mm. Holland, uh, Netherlands. And for those who want to start on the biography of Corrie ten Boom, for the first years you have to learn Dutch, <laughs> because all the letters here are in Dutch. <laughs> in the first, yeah, that's great to, uh, to read. Yeah. You had a question, sorry. Hi. 
health concerns and dying off of the youth and the need there and there and drugs and all kinds of things. Whereas um, you had mentioned also that the short-term mission trip kind of killed the, that, uh, that off a little bit the, of the continuum of that. Mm -hmm. Um, has there any research on people who are youth possibly going there and doing long-term, like just, just coming into the community and living there and, and uh, anything? Any so the question is whether there's a change in, in pattern of I doing guess. missions in but Europe? The readiness to have church mm. planting there in Europe. Do you, is there any pattern? And among, among um, uh, potential American missionaries or among Europeans? Mm. Yes, there are. I don't see it massively. Um, um, I know that um, um, the churches in Amsterdam, uh, there's, there's two things, um, uh, the, uh, reaching the new immigrants, and they live mainly in, um, in inner cities, uh, which means that um, it's a Christian-Muslim uh, dialogue or confrontation, whatever you want to call it. So that's very different from uh, what it used to be, and I don't think that uh, um, the young generation is 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 uh, most capable of doing that. They are more uh, um, able to to work, for instance, in uh, a shelter or a student a youth hostel. That's what what I see happening. Church planters, yes, there are a number of uh, American organizations that try to plant churches in um, in the Netherlands, and have been two or three examples of where they tried for 20 years a uh, return to the United States and the whole project folded. So that's, so far, is, it, is a message that if it's happening, it should be done by the natives. But, and that American models are, um, are perhaps put you on a track, but are, po potential, are not the textbook of how to do it. I'm involved in my own church in, in, uh, in developing a vision. Oh, what an American word. <laughs> vision. As long as not American. That's what the first thing they say. It's like, no. It's like, well, you're, you're always with your America. Huh? Why don't you go to live there? If it's so much better there than <laughs> grumpy, grumpy, grumpy. Uh, so that, that is a common uh, response there. But uh, so next time I tell them it's from Russia. <laughs> China. Oh, oh, China, yeah, sure, China, yeah, yeah. So I don't see that, that happening, and it's perhaps too early to tell. I, I keep safely to the 80s because uh, I can research that there's stuff there and the people to interview, but it's more the sociologists that uh, they need. But, I, but a, a quick answer to your question, I don't see that happening. Yeah. Any uh, last question? Yes, sir. Carl. How would you rate the uh, resistance to the gospel in France, for example, as compared to Germany? Whew. <laughs> <laughs> can you take an, I can, I can explain it for Holland, but uh, in, 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 in history, you mean? Well, well yeah, well, the, I, prepared, um, I prepared an answer to this question. <laughs> Carl, sorry. But I cannot answer G France and Germany. I don't know uh, enough about it. But did the experience of American missionaries confirm the sociological analysis of Berger and Focus? And there are uh, uh, sociologists of religion, and they identified five categories exactly. Ex it's coming, it's, I'm coming closer to answering your question of um, where uh, European societies differ from uh, American perspective. Uh, and one of them is uh, the category of structural differences. And most so mostly the difference between uh, in the relationship between church, church and state, and that's very different in France and Germany. Of course, you have complete laicite in in France, eh? no interference what whatsoever of the church and state uh, up till uh, the the very strict um, uh, laws against um, uh, scarves. Yeah. Uh, that headscarf is very important. That, that you w will not find that ever in uh, in Germany. So there's. There's much more uh, boundaries, so it's much more private in France. The second, um, uh, and you see it also uh, that the relation of church and state in the uh, assignment of uh, and uh, of of, uh, of visas, especially in Portugal and uh, in Spain and Italy. And the second category was cultural and intellectual. Um, and in France, again, the missionaries had to uh, 
uh, encounter the anti-clerical uh, nature of the French Enlightenment, very different from the British American Anglo Anglo American Enlightenment, which there's much more space for for religion there, uh, which also made it hard to open and uh, to have an open intellectual debate because uh, the French would immediately talk about the French. That don't let nobody tell them that I say something about them, but. <laughs> Uh, what, what I perceive is that they are uh, immediately anti-clerical. So if you're a missionary from America, you're a target of the spice and not a, a speaking partner. So I think that the anti-religious uh, atmosphere is much stronger there. Um, that, so that's a cultural factor. And what I see sense in uh, uh, what many missionaries also uh, uh, um, observed is that there is... Um, uh, in America, religion has been on the side of the um, liberators as much as they are on the suppressors, while in continental Europe, religion almost always sided with the establishment to push down uh, the, uh, the common man. Uh, and the third group of factors are the institutional differences that conditions the continuity of faith to the next generation and the absence of religious schools in France is uh, is clear. While in Germany, of course, you have much more uh, public uh, education, and in uh, in the Netherlands as well, raising children, religious uh, education, schools, and the fourth set of facts is regard to social composition, the class differences. Where do you, if you go to in in Holland, the the church is a middle class affair. Uh, what's happening in uh, in the United States is that every uh, every level has its uh, class. Not anymore, perhaps, but isn't it true something like Methodist or Baptist that can read and uh, Presbyterians are a Methodist with a bank account or something <laughs> like, like that. So there's this class differentiation <laughs> that you don't have. Uh, you have the mass church every, every b and the parish belongs to that. So it's very different if, you're, you're, if you don't belong to that, there's no place to go. And um, the, the, the fifth uh, is the category is the, the value of individualism. And that's a very hard category because um, most um, European nations claim that they're rather individualist. The Dutch think they are, but I don't think they are in the same way uh, that Americans are individualism in, in the sense that um, you, you immediately follow, uh, at least not in the, in the 50s and the 60s, follow your personal <laughs> taste. Whether that's different from France, I think there's more... Yeah, I, I, that's too difficult to uh, assess. You need a sociologist. But I, I would think that the resistance in France is much stronger because of those cultural values uh, uh, and the secularization that was institutionalized than in, in, in Germany. Satisfied? Okay. <laughs> well, I think at this point we'll uh, adjourn to the refreshments which have been provided by the Institute for the Study of American Evangelicals, and you can interact personally with Hans, but just one last thing is to thank him again for his excellent presentation. You're very welcome.